everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. My name is Cassidy Cash, that's Shakespeare Girl. This week we are exploring the world of mythical creatures mentioned in Shakespeare's plays by asking, did Shakespeare write about the basilisk? It's a leading question, I know, because the answer is yes, of course he did. Shakespeare mentions the word basilisk in parts two and three of Henry VI, in Henry IV, part one, as well as in Cymbeline, Richard III, Henry V, and A Winter's Tale. It seems the bard was a very fond of basilisks. These references themselves are not incredibly descriptive, but they demonstrate that his audience had an understanding of both what a basilisk was, as well as some of the common attributes of this creature. So it's important to us as audience members today to understand what the 16th century concept of a basilisk was. What would they have known when they sat there and heard that from stage? And what did William Shakespeare intend for you to think about when he used that creature instead of something else? William Shakespeare had many sources from which to pull from in terms of understanding what a basilisk was or in telling his story and using this creature. The basilisk itself was firmly established in popular lore and came from a lot of different sources that the bard would have known about. In fact, by the time Shakespeare was penning his own references to the basilisk, modern thought had largely moved away from thinking this might be a real creature to thinking it was largely a symbolic creature or one that was had connections to being a monster, but wasn't really thought of as being a real thing. But getting there was a process. The Basilisk first started out in ancient Greece, and it was thought of as this dragon-like creature with wings and the head of a snake. St. Hildegard wrote about the Basilisk in the 1100s, describing it as a creature born from an egg that had been sat upon by a toad. The weasel was considered the natural enemy of the basilisk, and it could be killed by showing it its own reflection in a mirror. It could also be killed by letting it hear the crow of a rooster. The embodiment of all that is truly evil made the basilisk also the natural enemy to the symbol of all that is good, Jesus Christ. Much of the religious and medieval art that depicts Christ has him defeating a basilisk-like creature, where the serpent reputation of the basilisk is often connected to images and medieval religious understanding of Satan. The basilisk is mentioned by name in the Greek Old Testament in Psalms 91 and Isaiah 59. Some historians think that the basilisk's original source is in the natural histories or bestiaries and was recorded as a real creature because there were real animals that the basilisk was based upon. So a lot like the unicorn that we looked at, where it's a word that could describe several different new animals explorers were discovering, the basilisk began began in a similar way. Most historians think the basilisk was originally describing the Egyptian cobra that can stand up really tall and it spits venom. It can rise up and strike and all of this would fall in line with the basilisk's ability to kill with a glance, throwing venom from its face, as well as the belief that the basilisk was not able to be killed through physical strength, but instead by reversing the direction of the evil glance back to the source. The belief that a creature called a basilisk was not only real, but posed such an actual threat to humans that real travelers would carry around a rooster, a mirror, or a weasel with them as protection against this creature they were worried they might encounter during their travels. Now, the travelers who were reporting back that they went to some foreign land and found a basilisk were not necessarily telling a lie, nor were they inflating what they thought they saw. They were using the word basilisk to describe real things. Not only could they have been describing the Egyptian cobra, but there's also the horned adder, the hooded cobra, and the gila monster, all of which modern historians and scholars think could have been candidates for what these travelers were talking about when they referred to a basilisk. Interestingly, there is actually a real animal known as the basilisk. In fact, there's an entire group of various kinds of lizards and even a few iguanas that get called basilisks. The green basilisk lizard, which is sometimes known as the Jesus Christ lizard, is an animal that lives in the forests of Central America. Now, while you might expect this guy to get his name from the Christ treading on beasts medieval artwork we mentioned earlier. Instead, he gets his name because he's able to skim across the top of the water on his toes. And so he looks like he's walking on water. So the basilisk lizard is compared to Jesus Christ, who also walked on water in the late first century. 
The word basilisk itself is actually an English translation of the Greek and the French words for basilisk. In Greek, it was basiliskos, and in French, it was the basilique. In classical and early languages of Europe, this same rooster slash serpent combo was known as a cockatrice. It's also thought to have been born of an egg with traits like breathing fire, delivering lethal venom, and ability to fly. The cockatrice also could be deadly with just one glance. Depending on who you ask, some scholars believe that the basilisk and the cockatrice are interchangeable. Other scholars believe that they are two distinct animals. The ones that think they are two distinct animals make a distinction between the basilisk and the cockatrice based on what kind of egg it was born from. The basilisk was born from the egg of a snake, and the cockatrice is thought to have been born from a hen's egg that got raised by a snake. So there's a few discrepancies about exactly whether they are the same thing. Alexander the Great felt basilisks were such an actual threat that he had mirrors installed between his army and the basilisk that was guarding a city. Legend holds that as soon as the basilisk saw his reflection, he died immediately. St. George similarly used his shield to show a basilisk his reflection and killed the creature right away. In the case of St. George, modern stories of St. George tell that he was fighting a dragon, which is the fire-breathing winged lizard with the head of a serpent image that the basilisk carries with it. Now, Shakespeare was not the first to employ the use of the basilisk, not by any means at all. In fact, he was acting on a large foundation of history, including people like Chaucer, Pliny the Elder, and even one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, Edmund Spencer, uses the basilisk in their works. Now, we've already established that Pliny the Elder was a source for William Shakespeare, and he described the basilisk in his account of natural history about 10 years before Christ walked on water by saying, it routes all snakes with its hiss and does not move its body forward in manifold coils like the outer snakes, but advancing with its middle raised high. It kills bushes not only by its touch, but also by its breath, scorches up grass, and bursts rocks. It, its effect on other animals is disastrous. It's believed that once one was killed with a spear by a man on horseback, and the infection rising through the spear killed not only the rider, but also the horse. Certainly a very fearsome creature indeed. By the 13th century, Albert Magnus was writing about the basilisk, and his writing is used to demonstrate that the legend of the basilisk was attached to alchemy. Magnus's writing gives the basilisk's ashes, like after you burn it up, the ashes are supposed to be able to turn silver into gold. For alchemical writings, the basilisk was sometimes considered a type of salamander. In the Philosopher's Stone, the basilisk is given the ability to turn anything into gold. It can cure all ills and sicknesses, and it can even give eternal life. It was known as the basilisk as well as the cockatrice and alchemical writings. For alchemists, the basilisk and the cockatrice were the same animal. By the time Shakespeare was writing his plays, people like Conrad Gessner, who if you study Shakespeare for any amount of time, you'll hear his name come up because he was a massively famous naturalist, and he wrote an account on the basilisk in his book Historia Animalium. Gessner considered it unlikely that the actual basilisk was a real thing. Edward Topsell, however, wrote a book called The History of Four-Footed Beasts and Serpents and Insects, in which he described the possibility of a cockatrice being born from a rooster's egg. Most modern historians think that Topsell was religiously obligated to think that this was true because it is the King James Bible that references both the basilisk and the cockatrice in two places. So if Topsell had said he didn't think this was possible, he would have been denying the Bible, and that was bad. One translation of Isaiah 59.5 reads, quote, they break the eggs of asps and weave the spider's web. He who would eat their eggs, having crushed the wind egg, finds in it a basilisk. The King James Bible, written in 1611, translate the same verse to say, they hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. That translation of the Bible lends itself towards the naturalist's conclusion that the basilisk was talking about the Egyptian cobra. Regardless of what they are referring to in the Bible with the word basilisk and cockatrice, these passages are the foundation of the Renaissance association of the basilisk and cockatrice with evil and the devil. 
as one historian puts it, quote, not only did the mentioning of the basilisk in Holy Scripture anoint the creature's existence with the highest authority, the evil, devilish, and diabolical view of the beast lent itself well to increasingly grotesque depictions, and the lack of descriptive detail in the biblical passages lent creative license to radical transformations to its physiological makeup as long as the name was preserved. I mean, Shakespeare could use this basically any way he wanted, and a lot of artists did just that. In the original text, Psalm 91 also refers to a basilisk, but interestingly, by the time it's translated in the King James Version in 1611, that word is changed to say adder. It was by the 12th century that basilisk and cockatrice became truly interchangeable and even to be representative of a kind of chimeral monster. Now, in Greek mythology, the chimera was a female fire-breathing dragon-type creature, but it kind of applies to any animal that's a combination of beasts breathing fire and capable of killing you. In medieval bestiaries, the cockatrice and basilisk were used interchangeably, and rarely did writers make a distinction between the basilisk and the cockatrice. So whether you're talking about the chimeral monster or the basilisk and cockatrice that got mentioned in the Bible, or you're referencing Greek mythology, this word basilisk could apply to all of them. All of this vague, convoluted, not really sure what it is definition, what created a great opportunity for creatives and artists who could put it on stage. And as long as they maintain some of the basic tenets of the legend surrounding the monster, they could really do what they wanted to. Lawrence Brenier points out that Shakespeare had a great deal of latitude in terms of what his audience would understand or arrive at the theater conceptualizing as the idea of a basilisk when he says, I got ahead of my notes here. I am referencing Lawrence Brenier, but he didn't actually say this. The scientific article that was posted anonymously is the author that's saying this, not Lawrence Brenier. I cite this correctly on the image and in the show notes. So check out today's show notes for a link to the article and all of the books and articles this anonymous writer used to write this article. Many of these images were based on contrivances of real basilisks. Small, dried, carved, and varnished marine rays and other fish were concocted and sold as actual basilisks. Some of these so-called, quote, Jenny Hanover's, several of which can still be found in some museums, were also created in the names of baby dragons, devil fishes, or some other suitably monstrous name. In fact, Gessner and Brown warn their readers against these impostures, or at least spending too much for them. Ulysses and Dravandi, in his Serpentum A. Draconum Historie of 1640, which is after Shakespeare, also warns of these Jenny Hanovers, even though some of his own illustrations are based on them. It's evident in museum artifacts and various writings from the time period that Shakespeare was living, as well as this one that's just after when Shakespeare was living, that the basilisk was very much an established part of popular culture and popular lore. You could go into a market and you would find for sale various preserved creatures being sold as an example of a basilisk. The entire concept of a basilisk and a cockatrice and what they looked like or were capable of were all over the map. So the basilisk was much more of a mythical creature than the unicorn, connected to alchemy and chimeral physiology, and artists were free to embellish what they wanted this creature to be capable of. That's why many paintings from this time period, when they get analyzed, the chimera or the basilisk or the cockatrice are generally interpreted to represent monstrosity in general, as opposed to having any specific symbolic meaning, which as you might imagine, plays very well into Shakespeare's role in the theater. To add a very pointed connection to the Renaissance theater for William Shakespeare, during the 16th and 17th century, the word cockatrice was used to describe a prostitute. And it was not actually a popular word in the vernacular or in literature. The most popular place that this word got used was actually on the stage. The word cockatrice being a slang term, almost every time that it gets used, it's referring to the creature's ability to kill with a glance, which is a common attribute of women of the night. In Shakespeare's case, most of his references to the basilisk does refer to the creature's ability to kill with a glance, but there is one other definition that Shakespeare employs. In his play, Henry V, he has Queen Isabel say this line, against the French that met them in their bent, the fatal balls of murdering basilisks, the venom of such looks we fairly hope have lost their quality and that this day shall change all griefs and quarrels into love. 
In this instance, Shakespeare's applying the definition of basilisk that defined it as a huge piece of ammunition carrying a large weight. It was a military weapon. And Shakespeare is applying a dual meaning here when he has Isabel use the word basilisk, both referring to ammunition as well as the basilisk monster definition that can kill with a look. Like so much of Shakespeare's language and word choice throughout his plays, his reliance on sources like Pliny the Elder, on the Bible and popular lore all come into play when he is using words like basilisk for his stories. There is so much more history to learn here, and I link to much of it in the show notes for today's episode. You can find pictures and images, links and books, and so much more if you want to explore this further. Find all of that at castacash.com slash basilisk. You can see how to spell basilisk in the little link down here at the bottom. It's also copy and pasteable below the video. Our show is now sponsored by the wonderful Audio Shakespeare Pronunciation app, and I link to their demonstration of the word basilisk in today's episode. We used it today to show you how to pronounce this word, and it's linked in the show notes. This app teaches you how to pronounce words like basilisk if you're performing Shakespeare's plays on stage, where this term is part of the dialogue. Find out more about this app and download it on iTunes or Google Play from castacash.com slash Shakespeare app. That's castacash.com slash Shakespeare A-P-P. Thank you for being here. That's it for this week. I'm Cassie Cash, that's Shakespeare Girl, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.